So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for um, turning up right after lunch. Hopefully you don't fall asleep. And um, if you haven't had a chance, try the food carts here. They are absolutely fantastic. There's a whole cluster of them, and there's not just the one cluster close to here, but there's a couple of other spots around the city that have just some fantastic uh, food that you're never going to get in most other places in the U.S. It's a really good ethnic variety and a good um, combination of different things to try. So thumbs up to the food carts in Portland. So I'm Jeremy McNichol. I'm from uh, Red Hat, and I decided to uh, take on uh, the large task of trying to get the Nexus 5X and 6P mainlined. So here's a brief overview of uh, who am I. So if you recognize me and you were ever at an Ottawa Linux symposium, I grew up in Ottawa and I pretty much went to most of the uh, OLSs in Ottawa. I was a repeat offender and uh, a regular attendee of the local uh, Linux community in Ottawa. So if you've been to Ottawa and, and attended an OLS, you probably recognize me. These are some of the toys that keep me sane beyond um, playing with bits and bytes. I, uh, I love being outside. I love bikes and riding bikes. I recently went to, uh, maybe a year ago, two years ago, I went to Europe, and while I was there, I went to Amsterdam. It was absolute bike heaven. So this is, uh, on the left, that's my trike that I used to ride in Ottawa. I only had uh, a cycling season of four months. Whereas now I'm in California and I get 12 months a year, which is just great. Um, and on the right-hand side, that's the Brompton I purchased when I was in Amsterdam. And that's uh, as I was purchasing it, I took a picture of it. It folds up into that suitcase and I can travel with it anywhere. I recently went to Japan and took it with me and traveled everywhere on bike. It was just awesome. I have it with me here. I did some riding this morning. And there's my bike at the top, my Brompton on top with a picture of it, the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. I live a couple of blocks from the Golden Gate Bridge right now, so that's a little bit about myself and, and how, what makes me tick. So why did I take on this effort? Um, to people here, I think it's really obvious. The answer to people here, because I know you guys get it, is why not? There's no mainline support for it, and the really simple answer is why not? Let's just do it, it's fun. It's something that I enjoy, it's something that, uh, it's interesting, it's challenging, it's uh, stuff that just keeps me, it's better than watching TV or playing video games. I mean, that's, it's more intellectually stimulating than watching TV, so, but you can do both at the same time. I mean, that's the sort of attitude that I have towards this. It's a, I almost feels like a hobby more than, a, than work, and when it feels like that, it doesn't really, it's not tedious, it's not difficult to motivate yourself because you're not being forced to do it. So it's, it, that's why I didn't mind taking it on. Uh, when I took it on, it was the current latest generation phone and I thought it would be a lot of fun because I know at some point Google's going to drop support for it. And at that point, when they drop support for it, there are people in the community here that are going to want to keep playing with it. For example, the XDA community continues to hack on these phones long after uh, they've been dropped by the mainline people or by Google or by whoever else that's pushing these phones. As well, I thought it would be useful to do sort of the flagship phones so that others, other vendors would hopefully get inspired to follow suit and say, okay, look, this phone is mainlined, maybe we should try to put in the effort to mainline our phones as well. So it's sort of like saying, okay, look, here's the cookie cutter example of how you can go about getting your phone mainlined and the types of things you have to concern yourself with. Maybe other vendors can follow suit and, and follow in the path. That's going to maybe inspire them to do the right thing instead of just putting their code somewhere to follow the letter of the GPL, actually trying to get it into the main kernel and running. Um, there's no other reason for me, motivation-wise, other than it's fun. Uh, I work for the platform enablement team on, at Red Hat, and this is our 
job, our, our job descriptions are kind of like, we do whatever. It, we don't really have a set job description. So my job is typically supporting RHEL. So that's our bread and butter. That's where we make our money. But my boss has said to me, um, okay, you can, I want you to support RHEL, but I want you to find things in the community that you find interesting that you want to work on. So I took this on. I thought this would be a lot of fun. Um, and it's been very challenging and it's, it's quite interesting. I'm learning a lot about uh, phones. I had a fair background in the embedded world, in the PowerPC world, um, and then jumping into the phone world was a, a, I guess some people could say a rude awakening or an absolute eye-opening experience that how the phone world does things compared to the simplistic PowerPC world is um, very, very different. I was, I was quite, it was, it was definitely eye-opening. I, you know, I just decided to jump in wholeheartedly and um, a very naive kind of view. Go for it, let's see what happens. And I'll, I'll tell you the story about what happened. So here are the specs. I decided to actually include a slide if when I post these with the specs for the phone themselves so that if you want to look at it, I just took it from XDA Arena um, and I grabbed the 5X as well as, it's pretty small. But I made it small on purpose so I could fit everything in. So if you can't read it, I understand, I'm sorry. Later on, you'll be able to pull it up. The specs are pretty straightforward. They're all on the web, uh, publicly available, nothing, nothing hidden. Uh, I've got a list at the end of my presentation with links and references, and I've included these links and references with that. So you can just pull it up and look at it there, or just Google it. Uh, exact same thing here is the specs, what it came with at the time, and things like that, the dimensions, how much memory it had, the storage. Before I begin, there's some terminology, there's some marketing terminology, and then the terminology that the common engineers, normal folks tend to use. Um, I'm probably gonna use 8992, which is on the 5X. The marketing term is Snapdragon 808. It, it, so just bear with me, I'm gonna constantly use 8992 versus 8994, that's why I put, I can't seem to remember the marketing terms. I stick to the, the more technical terms. It's, it's easier to remember for me. And then the other term you're gonna to wanna to get used to is downstream. So downstream is anything that's not in kernel.org, be it MSM 310, the one that's published on Google or published on Code Aurora, I consider that downstream. And those are the terms that I'm gonna use throughout this just so that you're uh, familiar with it and the integration branch is something that the Lanero folks who are doing a fantastic job at mainlining things um, they have something called a, an integration branch and that's also a term and it's, I've got a link to it at the end of my, my presentation um, they call they use the term integration branches where they put all the all the different pieces that people are working on into one common spot so people can uh, work as a team within Lanero on these on these sorts of things so where did this all start? Um, the last ELC in San Diego that I attended, I think there was other ELCs or other conferences. Um, the one that I went to was in San Diego and I was kind of poking around at the idea of trying to get the Nexus 5X uh, mainlined because I was looking at it and I said, okay, maybe I'll, I'll go take a look and see if the phone is working with the latest and greatest kernel. Sure enough, it wasn't there. I saw different bits and pieces about things that were um, working and weren't working, and I was like, okay, what is, what is this? Maybe it'll actually just work. So I went and bought the phone, and I turned up to the conference. It was like a week before the conference. Turned up to the conference and ran into a bunch of people from Ottawa that I knew that were working for Lanero or other people, that, different companies from Ottawa that I'd already knew, and uh, talked to them and said, hey, I've got this phone. I'd like to try to get it to work on mainline. Their initial reaction is a little chuckle, and then they're like, are you sure? Yeah, why not? It'd be great fun, sure. So they're like, okay, so how do I get serial console? As an embedded person, the first thing out of my mind is, I need serial. And that was the first challenge. Because of the great people there and the great people within the community, it was a matter of me talking to these people and saying, you know, okay, I wanna actually try to get this phone working 
I mean, I said, well, how hard could it be? You've got downstream support. You've got a kernel that's already published by Qualcomm or Google. I mean, it's 3.10 based. It was, at the time, it was 4.3 or 4.4. I said, oh, it's pretty small delta. It can't be that bad. I mean, nothing's really changed. I mean, how hard can it be? It's just to, to, to do a diff, and you're off to the races. And then I ran into well, there, Stephen Boyd's presentation on the MSM fork, and it was like 1.5 million lines of code. Um, OK. That's when I sort of reality set in. I'm like, this may be a little bit more challenging than I originally anticipated. So, so I said, you know what? Why not? This is, this is, I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment, so let's just, let's just do this and have fun. So I, I, actually, I actually decided to go at it whole hog and, 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 and have fun and see what would happen. So I talked to the people at the conference. I said, you know, what do I do? Where do I even start? So because they were, people were just so helpful and considerate and, and, and kind, typical of the Linux community. And it's, it's something I can't emphasize enough that regardless of the fact that people are in all these different companies and every, every other company has got, you know, they're all differing opinions about how to do things at the upper levels. But the people that attend these things and the Linux people within these companies all have the same sort of mentality of helpfulness, willing to offer advice, even if you don't want it. Um, you know, reach out to people whenever somebody asks for help. I mean, this is, this is typical of the community that I was used to in Ottawa. And I'm seeing it continuing on. Um, you know, obviously it's not perfect, but it, it's actually a very good thing to see and to be part of. And that's what, one of the reasons why I wanted to, I wanted to do this. I thought it'd be fun to give back, be, to do something that, you know, there was no support for, it's fun. Let's just get it working. The typical Linux mentality of why not? Um, and at, at that embedded conference in San Diego, at the end of the day of the, uh, that I was asking about building a debug cable, I was able to walk away. That night, I drove to Fry's. There's a Fry's in San Diego. I literally drove to Fry's that night and bought the board that the Linero folks suggested um, uh, that they use for a lot of their targets um, for their lab. And it was simply one of these boards that you get for like, um, I don't know what you call it, Arduino or those uh, BeagleBone Blacks. And it's just an FTDI chipset with 3.3 volts and 5 volts switchable. And you just had to, I just had to buy a cable with the ear jack that plugs into the phones. Let me grab the two phones here. So here's the two phones. When I turned up to San Diego, I literally had the Nexus 5X in my hands and I said, you know, this is, this, is, this is what I want to do. I've just got a phone, I've got a charging cable. How do I get to the real console? And they said, you know, somebody that I knew that was part of Lanero introduced me to somebody else, introduced me to somebody else, and that person was like, this is what you need. Here's the equipment that you need. You know, cut the wire here, split it. These are the colors that go here, here, and here. And literally that night, um, every time I travel, I carry duct tape. And you know, toenail, toenail clippers, and literally, that's the picture of, of that night when I got back after the conference. I cut the wire, stripped it, and attached it to the board that I bought at Fry's in San Diego, and I had a fully functioning debug cable within five or six hours of asking how to get it to work. So it's a true testament to you know, duct tape and, and the, the helpfulness of the community. Um, so that's, that's a picture of, yeah, you can get it working without all kinds of fancy uh, soldering and electronics and all this fun stuff. Just, you know, it's, it's the way uh, real work happens. And then the, um, while I was there, I was talking to different people, and they said, okay, you know, once you get it up and running, you're going to have various problems that aren't things that at the time, things weren't mainline. So, Stephen Boyd, there he is right there, was kind enough to put me in touch with a guy in Germany by the name of uh, Bastian Koschar. And he had done the global clock support or the baseline support for clocks, which was common for 
um, allowed was common between the 5X and the 6P or the 8992 and the 8994. So I contacted him. And while I was you know, contacting different people and, and contacting the guy in Germany and trying to get the information from him and get his patches, I started looking at the delta between 310 and, and whatever main line was to see just a diff to see what I could do and, and see if it was possible and think through possible scenarios. And I thought, okay, I could try to do the whole phone at once, which is kind of foolish. I've been in this industry long enough and I've done enough embedded work that trying to do the whole phone in one fell swoop would just be almost impossible. So I thought, okay, what would be the best way to approach this so that it's the least amount of work to get people going who would possibly want to help? And I thought, okay, the easiest thing would be one CPU running off an NRD with serial or debug serial. So that's the way that I approached it. I thought that is the least amount of work to allow things to happen in parallel and get that main line, work on, on getting that main line. Once that's main line, then people can start adding pieces and can start looking at other stuff in parallel. And that's the whole idea. If you try to do the whole thing yourself, it'll take you six months. You'll have to rebase, things will change so much. Whereas if you get some initial work in mainline, you, your stuff is gonna get carried forward and anybody that changes an API or, or an ABI or whatever you wanna call it, has to make sure that your stuff continues to work. And that's sort of the agreement, the unwritten agreement within the community, that if you make a sweeping change, you've gotta to verify that everything is working. Or at least contact the person, somebody that has the hardware that can test it for you to make sure you haven't broken anything. So this is why I wanted to get it you know, in early and often. One, people will change it for you and maintain it for you. Two, it's going to allow other people to, to get going and to help out as much as possible. And that was kind of my goal. So I put together a quick list of what's working. Instead of saying, this is what I need help with, or this is what's remaining, I thought, well, why don't I just make a quick list of what I know is currently functioning as of two nights ago, three nights ago, and where things stand. Um, you'll look at, so we have one CPU going on both phones. Uh, I tested it, and it's fully functioning. So I got both, both phones fully functioning at this point. I can test both of them now. I've got an init RD or RAM disk, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've got debug serial through the debug port. Um, that should be here somewhere. Okay, I didn't bring it with me. I forgot the debug cable back in the hotel. I've got um, onboard storage going. I sent out some onboard uh, SDHCI and MMC patches. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if they've been picked up. I have to loop back and see. I know the clocks, the clock work for that was merged, but the actual DT or device tree changes, I'm not sure where they stand. If they haven't been merged at this point, I'll loop back around in a couple of days and do a resend of the latest version of the DT changes to see, to get some uh, more eyes on them for review. The pin control stuff from the Lanero folks, I did maybe 85% of it myself. And then the Lanero folks um, had, I think they had already started it or they had something which was close. Um, and they were able to, uh, I believe it was Michael Scott, sent something out and it got merged. So the pin control stuff is fully functioning now. And I'm, I, you know, after I sent out the um, MMC or SDHCI stuff, I was discussing people different ideas with people at Plumbers, and I looked at the various things that, I, you know, that were working or were not, and I wasn't sure you know, what was the next piece I wanted to tackle, and I had some discussions. I thought that instead of me telling, you know, standing around and, and, and talking to you guys and just saying, you know, okay, this is where it's at, this is what we've done, here's a few things, I would like to have sort of an open discussion or a brainstorming session with you guys for the different pieces that we could potentially, notice how I said we, I don't want it to be me, I'd like you guys to help, so um, we could potentially tackle next or some of the uh, pieces that would give us the most bang for our buck. Working in yes, 
all the patches have been submitted. SDHCI or the onboard storage has, I don't know if it's been mainline, but literally, as you can see here, it's in 410 RC1, it got picked up. Uh, and the on, it, it, if you want to use it, all you need is a debug cable and do an init RD. You can take a look at the, at the end of my presentation, I've included a list of references. And as part of those references, I've got um, my lead into my initial changes had a, a set of, had a bunch of details on the compiler I used, the branch, um, and things like that. So it's just a matter of getting a cross compiler going from Linero or for wherever you want and compile it up and then load it onto your, onto your phone. It's pretty straightforward. It's, it, it's actually working. That is one commit. That, it didn't go in into one big chunk. It went in through device tree, through DT bindings, through, uh, what else? Um, some config changes and then the actual device tree changes themselves. But it's all been mainlined. Uh, and the clocks are there as well. The clocks went through the clock tree. So I just want to give full credit and, and thumbs up to Bastian Koshar. He did a, a, hopefully I didn't mispronounce his name. Um, he did a fantastic job in getting the global clocks working. Um, if it wasn't for him, I think I would have been scratching my head a lot longer and he he really pulled it together and he did a great job. Um, I was quite impressed with his uh, effort in getting the clocks, being able to pull the clocks together and, and, and working. So it's a true testament to, you know, geographically di diverse people talking and working together for a common interest was, was actually quite nice to see. So here's an example of what was needed for yeah, the yellow, okay, so I highlighted the yellow on purpose. So it's there to show you that the string that I highlighted, if you look, it's all the same string. It's, it's blsp1 underscore uart1 underscore apps underscore clock underscore source. If you're forward porting anything at all, please try to keep the names similar because it's gonna make people's lives when you're grepping two trees a little bit easier. And it's gonna make, you know, from my perspective, grepping trees and looking at an older kernel versus a newer kernel, trying to understand what was done before versus now, for example, on the MSM 8996, trying to look at the older kernels, comparing it to what's there now. Keep the names the same to make people's lives easier or at least as close as possible so you get some kind of clue as to what this variable or what this thing does or is. That was the one problem I had. So this is an example of, of what was done. On the left is mainline, and that is what he used as a reference, the 8916, because it was in the 310 kernel at the time. And there's the mainline version. So you can see it's fairly similar. But there's enough differences that you're sort of like, OK, it's not quite the same, but it's similar enough that you can kind of guess. Um, but there's other problems, there's other little subtleties and some, some, of the, some of the names aren't quite similar and some of the clocks aren't quite similar. So that's where you start getting tripped up. It, it, is, it is the other issue that we had and the other issue that he wanted me to bring up to make sure people are aware of is the lack of documentation. There's nothing out there produced by the vendors to give to the public. So I wanted to... Uh, when I first set out, I wanted to go and find the documentation for this before I started, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, I knew people in Qualcomm who had the ability to provide the documentation to us, and they still, even on an NDA, they still wouldn't provide it to us. So I was, I was it's unfortunate. I'm, I'm not going to judge either way. That's not why I'm here. I'm just trying to let people know that Having the documentation would be a nice thing, but it's not essential. If the code is published, you can use the code as a reference. It makes life a little bit more difficult, but it is doable. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't care either way. 
ideally documentation and, and having it available freely and openly and being able to sign an NDA would be even better. But using downstream code is fine. That way, when somebody reviews your code and says, hey, you haven't done it quite correctly, well, that's how downstream did it. Sorry, you know, unless you, somebody from Qualcomm or Code Aurora or Lanero can explain to me why it was done like that before, that's what you're going to get. So that's what happens. Um, it's, it just benefits everybody if somebody can explain it or if uh, the documentation is available. But to Qualcomm's uh, and Code Aurora and Lanero's um, credit, they've been fantastic at providing document, uh, not documentation, but answers on IRC and through email, and they've been very cooperative and collaborative um, from the different people I've worked with. I've got nothing but praise for them as a, as a company to work with and to collaborate with, as well as uh, the people at Lanero. So this is an example, and it, it, it kind of looks close, but it's so slight, it's, it's different enough that it's not something you want to tackle after a couple of beers. You want to be pretty, you know, a, a cup of coffee and then scratch your head a little bit, and you can see there's some subtleties and some some similarities that you can probably tackle it. Here's another example of the downstream version versus the uh, mainline version of, oh, that actually should be on the left, it should be 96, oh, that's a typo. I'll fix that before I post it. So as you can see, okay, so this is, um, actually no it's not. This is the version that I'm looking at because I'm looking at PCI and I'm trying to figure out, because one of the things I'm thinking about tackling next is Bluetooth. And PCI is one of them. And I'm trying to figure out, OK, how does it, what PCI clocks and what branches do I need? And I know that the 8992 clocks are fairly similar. I think they're fairly similar to the 8996. So I'm trying to find some breadcrumbs in the current version of the 8996 that I can use to understand the 8992 version. So, in the downstream. So these are the kind of things that you have to sort of get right, brace yourself for when you're looking. There's, you kind of have to guess and maybe hope that some of the breadcrumbs of what's there match up what you can find and see if you can kind of connect the dots. So here's a, a quick sampling of the files that are available in downstream. On the top is downstream, on the bottom is mainline. And uh, Mainline, there's not that many clocks. Hopefully, we'll get the clock people to add a few more, but that's just my hopefulness and wishful thinking. And then the top window is what's there for the um, downstream stuff. And you'll see that it's, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of various clocks and a lot of different things that you try to match them up and try to piece it together. And it's, it's, it gets kind of, it can be kind of uh, difficult. I was using 3.10 as a reference, but uh, somebody from Lanero pointed out that there was actually a 3.18 version, which matched up with the 89.96. So now I've been using that, and it's been kind of helpful. I couldn't find it before, but it took some click here, click there, click there, go to Cordero and click there, click there, do this, click there. Oh, there it is. Sweet. So then once I finally found, somebody showed me where to find it, I was able to find the 89.96 uh, stuff and match that up. Some of the things that I've learned along the way, some of the things I'd like to pass on to you guys that I think to be useful if you want to tackle something like this is try to get things sent upstream as fast as possible. Don't let things sit stale in your trees or in your repos or, or whatever it is. The faster you get it to some kind of mailing list for review, the faster other people can pick off patches and try them for you. So that's one of the things that I've been doing, actually. I've been looking at some of the stuff that the Lanero folks have been doing, or the Code Aurora, and I'm like, oh, off a of mailing list. I'm like, oh, I could, let me try that patch. That could be useful for me. I'll go and grab it, put it in my tree, and either make a change to my code, and it'll turn out something that actually works, and then I can add my tested by, or I can offer some suggestions to them, or like the pin control. I found some errors in some initial versions of the pin control that I had done myself without documentation, 
pointing out that yes, you missed two or three little things here and they were able to update it. So be active, get involved, try to uh, see what's there and try to keep an eye on the mailing list and also jump on to IRC periodically because that's where a lot of the stuff gets resolved or a lot of the questions get answered. Um, the people on IRC, the MSM IRC mailing list, that's at the end of the presentation. Um, they've been fantastic in answering questions. I encourage you to join, ask them questions, be active. Um, even, if, even if you don't have a phone or you're not interested in forward reporting, get in and look at some of the patches, ask questions, get involved. Um, introduce people that want to be part of this into that. Uh, there's thousands of ways that you can get involved as a, as a, as a contributor to the community not just by submitting code, but reviewing code, um, maybe putting together some instructions, uh, looking for typos, spelling mistakes, uh, just eyeballing things. I can think of thousands of things that you can do as, a, as, a, as an individual. So some of the things, so somebody asked me at one point when I was at Plumbers, what's the end goal or what's the final um, thing that I wanna see happen with this? I'm not necessarily interested in seeing this thing fully mainlined or, or working 100% mainline. The thing that I think would be more important to me or what I'd rather see and be more rewarding is that somebody from the community or somebody not necessarily from the community, somebody that's new to Linux that wants to try kernel hacking or, or wants to consider going down the path of, of working on the Linux kernel maybe has a phone like this and says, okay, I'm gonna go and build this debug cable, like following the instructions. They put it together, they see some of the downstream code, they get it working, they, they create their own patch and then they submit it upstream and they would get it you know, into mainline. It would encourage them to consider the path of going down the kernel hacking or kernel development path. That, and then that to me would be a far more rewarding and be far more interesting to me to see somebody do something like that versus uh, getting the whole phone working because it's, you know, it's just a phone, it's just a device, but having people, you know, inspire somebody or, or motivate somebody to actually get involved in this community that's never been part of it before, I think that's far, far more rewarding as a, as a person. Maybe 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, we can cure world hunger. We'll get the whole thing working. I'm a lot more realistic now. I've, I've been around. I know full well that um, sometimes your, your rose-colored glasses aren't necessarily uh, as rosy as you think they are, and, and sometimes you can't necessarily get everything going. But I would love to see people new at the community get involved and, and actually be part of it. That, to me, would be... Uh, a lot more rewarding than seeing the, the phone fully functioning. Um, some of the things that, that as I, I'm kind of summarizing that some of the things that I, I see is everybody's sort of hell-bent on getting their name on X number of lines of code changed in the kernel. I, I'm just as happy seeing my name on reviewed by or tested by or I helped with whatever or, or, or provide feedback to people or being able to to, to be a, a number two in somebody's patch that they've put in a lot of effort into. That to me says, you know, taking a step back and actually being the guy on the side, providing support to somebody else is very valuable. Because when I was going through this, and I was like at V4, V5, and I was getting frustrated. And believe it or not, there were people that I never knew were paying attention to these, I would have dreamed they were paying attention to these patches and the, and the mailing list, and they actually sent me an email directly and said, it's great to see that you're working on this, keep going, I see that you're getting, it looks like you're getting frustrated, you know, continue on, cheerleader, rah, 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 toward a mentality. That's just as valuable as submitting code into the kernel, in my opinion. The guy that's, you know, been sort of beaten on or, or is trying to get the stuff done, is frustrated and having somebody motivate them or, or giving them that inspiration is, is very valuable. So consider that as a contribution as well. It's, it's don't, a lot of people that, are, are, that I talk to or their mentality is okay, it's big and scary, it's ugly. 
It's not. People are very supportive. They're, they're willing to help. My experience in doing this was actually very positive. And uh, please, give it a whirl. Try it. Don't be afraid. Um, it's, it's something that, that you have to try and you have to, you have to do this. So at this point, I was going to kind of brain, what I want to do is brainstorm. We've got 15 minutes left. I want to brainstorm with you guys um, ideas on, and reasoning behind the next subsystem that hopefully we as a community could tackle, not just me, but I guess it will be me. But, you know, if you guys could ideally try to help, um, it would be fantastic. So the reason why I did the initial one CPU and NRD was because and get it mainline as fast as possible so other people can get involved. Now I'm thinking, okay, I've got the onboard storage working. The patch has been out there. They have it mainline or not. I'm not sure if they got picked up. I'll loop back around and get them. Let's pretend that they're fully functioning and they are mainline. So what's left? What are some of the subsystems that we could tackle next? And it would be the screen. Okay, so if somebody having a screen there, yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but how do you type? You know, what do you use to type? USB, I was thinking at Plumbers, USB would be a good candidate. Wi-Fi, IDC, SPI, I'm just reaming off different subsystems. Can anybody think of an, a different a subsystem that would be, I guess we have to need a microphone. Um, or speak loud and I'll repeat it so that the recordings can capture it. Go ahead. You probably want to worry about battery charging. Yeah, I leave mine connected to my computer the whole time. I don't actually, I, okay. To be honest, I don't consider this a phone. I just use it as an embedded board. So if I take it to a coffee shop, it's not a bare board and it doesn't look that bad. It, it, to me, it's just an embedded target. There's no difference between a bare board and, and this phone. It has serial, I have CPU, I treat it like an embedded target as an embedded guy. Um, I can just leave it on a table and it, it looks like it's being charged. So you're right, battery charging. So maybe the Lanero folks could start tackling that. I wanted to, I was thinking more in terms of a subsystem, oh, I turned it on somehow, a subsystem that would allow people to build off of the stuff that's already there, maybe not having uh, a debug cable. Maybe um, if they wanted, I think maybe Bluetooth would be the next one, or USB. I'm not sure what state USB is currently in mainline or if it's, if it's close enough because you could, if USB was close enough that we could maybe use that, get that working, and you could actually log into the device and, and work like that, and then you could use crash dump, and then, you know, what would be, the, what would be a common, common sense order of things that could be tackled? You know, I'm thinking Bluetooth, USB, Wi-Fi, so you can, you can get maybe, um, you could log into the device with maybe a, a drop bear. I'm trying, okay, so I'm trying to do everything using an NetRD, and that has proved to be very difficult. Um, I've run into problems with it. I can't seem to get a RAM disk bigger than 2.1 megs for some reason. I've moved the RAM disk around in memory in different places. I've tried all the different combinations. When you do a make uh, boot image, I just can't seem for the life of me to get anything more than two megs working. Uh, so if anybody here knows how to get a large, the reason being is I don't want to wipe out what's on the phone. I want to keep it intact so I can go back and look at what was done in 3.10 so I can get, because I don't have documentation, I need 3.10 to be functioning. So I need a fully functioning phone so I can poke at Bluetooth or poke at PCI, print stuff out in the serial console so I can see what's going on. Um, that again is something that I encourage you to, it's a great skill to learn is that figure out the subsystem you want to tackle and then try to trace, you know, track down old code because you can, you can learn a lot about different subsystems by forward porting it. So if you want to learn something on PCI, forward port PCI, you can track down the code in the old code and then you can you know, put all kinds of prints all over the place and then try to get the new stuff working. That's an amazing way to learn how this stuff works. I would de definitely encourage everybody to try something like this. It's a, an unbelievably great learning experience. So I decided to tackle Bluetooth because I thought, all right, 
USB at the time when I was thinking about it may not have been all that stable, may not have been quite there yet or mature. So I thought, Bluetooth, I'll tackle that. So here's the logic behind Bluetooth and the path that I took and, and, and the way that I did it. Hopefully some of the tips and the way that I'm doing it will be beneficial to others and you can maybe learn something from it. And I would like to learn something from you guys if you can suggest things from me, to me as well. So if you look at it, the first thing I did was I went to the teardown site. There's a place in Ottawa where I'm from, it's actually Canada, Chipworks, who does reverse engineering of products to describe what's in each of these different ones. So I went to the teardown site, I went to Chipworks, and I found what was actually on the phone for Bluetooth. The 5X and 6P apparently have different Wi-Fi modules, but this phone has the QCA6174, and it, that's the device itself. And, and it also, putting breadcrumbs in the older kernels, it also actually has using TTY HS0 as its way of communicating. So it goes through PCI, it's on, this chip is on a PCI bus, and it, the Bluetooth software, the Bluetooth, Android Bluetooth stack talks to it through TTY HS0. Then I looked at different things on the web to try to figure out, okay, how does this all fit together? I don't really know much about Bluetooth, so I decided to go and, and poke around and try to understand these things. So I, I found some stuff on the different Code Aurora and different places for lib Bluetooth, and I found that you know, different reset commands, you gotta hit it with a GPIO to turn on Bluetooth, you gotta send the reset command, and then all the data starts flowing when you get through the serial console after you do this initial stuff. So these are some breadcrumbs that I'm able to actually get some logic and try to understand uh, the different things. So. Here's kind of the thing after poking around and looking around, here's the things that I think I need. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more. I'm sure I'm gonna trip over all kinds of different things that I never anticipated. But this is kind of the logic behind the start. Poking around, kind of looking at downstream. I understand a basic flow. So here's what I think I'm gonna need. PCIe clocks, uh, the Phi clocks as well. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, another Linero person for pointing me at their PCIe enablement for the MSM 8996. Uh, it gave me some clues as to some of the things I'm gonna need to get going. So again, another, another thumbs up to the, uh, and kudos to the, to the Lanero folks. So I'm gonna need to get the Phi working, I'm gonna need to get, uh, again, the PCIe, there's the, the chip, and uh, after beating around Google, I found that the QCA 6174 is supported by the Athros 10K chip. I don't know much about the code. I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. I am, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and use the back ports. I'm gonna try and get the Athros chip working on the three, the, the, the 10K code. I'm gonna try and get it working on the 310 kernel using the back ports. I'm gonna, as an experiment, to see if that works. If that works, and that tells me that the code is actually functioning and I can use the mainline version of that. So I found that the backport people have uh, support for the Athros, the latest and greatest Athros 10K driver working on 3.10 using the backports project. So that's something that I'm, I'm gonna actually look at and try to understand the code to verify that it's actually functioning. I know I need to get RPM S SMD communication working. That's another thing. It sort of works, there's some gotchas here and there that I need to iron out and discuss with uh, Bjorn. I don't know if he's here, I'll track him down. There's also some loser space work for blues and the firmware that I need to look at. I haven't quite figured out those pieces yet. I'm thinking the easiest way at this point would be to use blues instead of the Android Bionic, because it seems like there's more information about blues. So this is where I'm trying to get, I'm trying to use, a, I'm trying to avoid modifying the onboard storage as much as possible, or because I can't get an NRD running, I'm trying to figure out, okay, is there a partition on the phone that I can use to put the stuff that I need on there? Because there's like 45 partitions or something like that. So I would like to maybe put a RAM disk on there and then maybe do a cheroot once I boot from a RAM disk, cheroot into a, to one of the partitions and go from there because I kind of want to leave the phone 
alone. So that's where if anybody has any suggestions or any, any follow up with me, I would very much appreciate it. Send me an email, come and talk to me afterwards, uh, raise your hand and offer suggestions. So I'm here to solicit help. Anybody that wants to participate, anybody that wants to help, I have debug cables that uh, the Google folks were kind enough to give me. They've made them. They didn't have the duct tape versions. They did it more professionally looking, but I prefer duct tape. That's just my way of doing things. Uh, it's the way I roll. And I, there's, there's so much things to be done. If you have a phone, it's no longer the latest and greatest, so you can sacrifice it. Maybe if you want to play with it, let me know. I've got some debug cables I can give to people. I made a couple. Uh, I've given one or two away. I've got a bunch at home. I was going to bring them with me to give them out here, but I forgot them at home, unfortunately. I'll mail them to you. I don't mind spending three or four dollars mailing them to people. Uh, and, and, and hopefully people will uh, be willing to help out. So here's a few things that I can think up up the top of my head that I know need some help or some work. Uh, the RAM disk, I need help with that immediately so that I can continue my work or point me to a partition that I can explode a RAM disk to so it can chirrut into. As I said earlier, anybody that wants to take on a subsystem, please do so. Don't look at me as owning this thing completely myself. That's not something I'm doing. I did the initial heavy lifting. Now it's up to you guys to help out. Hopefully you guys can find ways to help out and, and, and be part of this. Um, just because it was one serial and, and, and it sounds like you know one CPU serial and an NRD, oh no, that's not very much. Oh yes, it is. It's, it's a lot more work than you think. It's when there's nothing coming out of the console, you have no idea what's going on. At least now you have a console and some serial debugs. So you've got some ways of, of finding out what's going on. You can always use KGDB over serial, but eh, depends on your view of KGDB, and let's not go down that road. Um, you can help me investigate various subsystems, uh, explain some of the different aspects of Android that I may not be familiar with because I'm coming from the embedded systems background and roll my own in idrd. Um, I, I haven't really had a chance. I tried building Android, uh, the full a AOSP, and it took, I think, uh, half a day and I gave up. I, I just kept building and I just, I, it was just too long. I said I can't, you know, I can do my own in idrd in like 25 minutes. I don't want to wait half a day for this thing to build. So I gave up on that. If you have any interest or, or in playing with the kernel or getting involved, please come and talk to me. I would like to work with you. I, I would love to see, as I said, I would love to see somebody who's never tackled this before express an interest and, and, and get involved and learn and turn it into a potential career. That, to me, would be more rewarding than seeing the whole phone functioning. Um, that speaks volumes for the community, and that's just my opinion. I guess maybe as I get older, I, I kind of see more of the getting people involved rather than changing the world. It's more um, seeing people learning and, and, and growing than necessarily uh, getting everything functioning and changing the world. Documentation is also an area that people could help out with, a wiki, uh, update some wikis or point me to some wikis that I could add things to that I've, I've tripped over or I've seen or, or there'd be a value. Here's my list of references and links. And Stephen, a mention of Stephen Boyd's presentation, a YouTube link, and the debug cable. I put together the, the, the link there, as well as Google has published the Gerber files and all the, like, the actual schematics for it. So if anybody knows how to build anything like that or is willing to do that, come and talk to me because it would be really cool if we could do a run of 100 of them or 200 of them or 300 of them and for a cheap price and then maybe we could get a company that's got some money to build them and then we could give them out to people in the community as a community donation or something like that. That was something I was discussing with the Linero folks a while ago, doing a run of two or 300, finding a company to pay for them and then handing them out to people that are, are interested in, in volunteering. That's pretty much all I wanted to discuss. Any questions or comments or suggestions? I've got two minutes left. I can repeat it. I don't think it's a microphone. Uh, I'll just repeat what your question is so that uh, the people 
recording at home. So anybody have any questions or comments or suggestions? Anybody willing to volunteer? Question here. They're low-hanging fruit. I agree they're low-hanging fruit, but what would it buy us? A touch, okay. ITC peripherals, okay. But I got to figure out what the peripherals are. I don't have any documentation. I got to figure out what peripherals are hanging off of I2C first. Touch, okay. So there's a lot of things that I don't know that I'm just trying to figure out as I go along. So I'm not going to pretend that I actually know how this works. I just look at it and say, okay, this looks like an interesting thing. Maybe I'll go learn this. And that's, that's what I find fun and interesting and, and motivating. And that's one of the reasons why I did it. Is there any other, any other comments or questions? Anybody way back there that I can't see? Oh, wow. Anybody? You have to come. Spy, I2C sensors. What would the sensors give us? What would, what would it buy us? Like, I'm thinking like Bluetooth so people can log in and start developing. But why would, what would be the motivation for doing I2C spy and sensors? What would be the motivation? Low hanging fruit, okay. So that other people can pick off different peripherals. You can't access the sensors. You gotta you got speak louder so I can repeat it because it's not. I didn't, I didn't catch all of it. You don't have to repeat yeah, it. So, um, the sensors I have used, okay. Mainline IMU code. So after this, come and talk to me, and I'll give you my card and send me some more details. That'd be great. That's something that I'd like to see. I don't know enough about it. I'd have to start learning something. So any other questions? I literally am out of time. We started two minutes late, but that's fine. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Anybody want a free cable for volunteering to help? Anybody, anybody? I'm just, okay, you'll take one? Okay, come and, come and, come and talk to me. Uh, so see me outside, I'll stand outside. Uh, obviously I'm pretty easy to find with uh, my orange shirt. So come and see me outside after this so the next people can get in and we can uh, discuss things further. Thank you very much and thanks for attending. Appreciate everybody's time.